Hey everyone, Mika here. In this video, I'm going to show you how I started with zero dollars coming from a broken and divorced immigrant household to turning zero into $26 million of invested money with just myself and my amazing wife, Lauren. You ready for this? First, I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey so you get the full story, and then I'm gonna give you the secrets at the end, so make sure to stay for the secrets. Oh, and of course, this video is sponsored by Life Insurance. You can get in as little as five minutes, and two free stocks you can get worth up to $1,600 via the link down below. Let's get started. In 2008, I met Lauren in Paris, and in 2009, I moved from South Florida to Ventura, California with no money and no idea what the heck I was going to do. So I did what every normal person does. I ditched school to play StarCraft because rumor had it StarCraft 2 was coming out. Well, then I decided I should probably try to make some money. So I started at entry level jobs like Hollister and working at Jamba Juice and eventually worked at Red Robin. And I always figured that, you know what, eventually I could probably just find one of these darn minimum wage jobs where I could finally love the store and love everything about it and work my way up to be CEO one day. But then I realized that's probably much more likely in the 1950s, but not so likely in 2009. So I decided college was the answer. Despite flunking my junior year of high school, I got straight A's at junior college so I could transfer to UCLA with in-state tuition rates and apply for substantially reduced tuition costs because I got straight A's. Now, that was a grind in itself, but I was living in California supporting myself and every bit of money mattered, so I did whatever I could to try to just get ahead and graduate college debt-free. But in college, I realized, well, while I'm going to college, I got four years, a smartphone, and a laptop. There has to be a way to make money. And I'm not gonna do the 2009 version of drop shipping or Amazon FBA, AKA eBay wholesaling. And I wasn't about to be a day trader. <laughs> Statistically, day trading was just not something that I wanted to start even trying. So I decided I needed to do some actual work that had the potential of making me more money with less time and gave me the ability to have a schedule that I wanted to have because well, I had meetings all day long on Tuesday and Thursday called college. <laughs> so I figured, hey, how about selling real estate? Which, that's convenient because with real estate, you can make your own schedule. And so this is where, boom, I realized crap. I'm 19 years old and I don't really seem too credible when it comes to selling houses after all I'm 19. And we just came out of the worst financial crisis we've had since the Great Depression. Welcome to 2009 and 2010 real estate. So I thought, well, if I gotta convince people that now's the right time to buy a house, the best thing to do is buy a house myself. <laughs> but I didn't have any money. I had 9,000, I guess I didn't have any money. I had some money, I had $9,000 saved up. Uh, by the time I had my real estate license and I started deciding, you know what? I should probably buy the house. And some of that was probably around three to $4,000 of money that I just got lucky YOLOing into Apple stock and then watching that double over the last, you know, three years <laughs> come 2010, 2011. Got lucky on that timing, but hey, Lauren and I had about $9,000 saved up. Lauren had been working for a year longer than I had. She was working at Mrs. Fields and we thought, hey, let's buy a house. And there are four ways to buy a house when you're getting started. Number one is you buy a house yourself, but that wasn't gonna happen. I just got my real estate license and I'm going to college full time and college doesn't pay too well. Number two, you can graduate college with a degree in something that you could then also use at work. And then on day one, after you graduate college, lenders will say, hey, you graduated college coding or as a software engineer, and now you're working at, you know, someplace coding. Well, oh my gosh, you qualify with two years of work experience because you went to school for the same thing you're doing now. Here, have a loan. But that wasn't gonna work because, well, I wanted a loan while I was in college. So uh, that left option three and option four. Option three was known as taking out a hard money loan. This is basically where you find a really good property, like a cheap house you can fix up and flip, and you buy it using a hard money loan, and you pay an exorbitant amount of fees, like three, two to three percent in fees, plus you pay like nine percent in interest. It's ugly. But it makes sense if you get a really good deal. And I conveniently came across a house in a neighborhood that was a three bedroom, two bath, and it was totally gutted. This neighborhood was like a $450,000 neighborhood. And I'm like, 
oh wow, this place is listed for two hundred eighty-seven thousand five hundred dollars, uh, and I think it only needs like forty to fifty thousand dollars of work. And I thought to myself, I mean, it can't be that hard. I mean, like I I could probably paint and do drywall. I mean, I've never done it before, but like you know, I, there's always YouTube, which was true back then too. <laughs> uh, so. I made an offer planning to use a hard money loan, and this is called buying a wedge deal or getting a golden ticket because you spend 50K fixing it up. Well, now you're into it for say 300 plus 50, you're into it for 350, but it's in a $450,000 neighborhood, which means you kind of got $100,000 in net worth that goes into your pocket. So by buying a house that was a fixer upper, we could bump our net worth from $18,000 to 100 grand like day one. And then if there was any appreciation on top of that, well, that would just be bonus. And so that's when I realized, wait a minute, this is a Bank of America foreclosure. And there are two cash offers on it already. How's some doofus 19 year old with $18,000 using half his girlfriend's money gonna buy a house like this for $300,000? So I went to Bank of America. I went to Bank of America's lending center and they said, Kevin, because this is a Bank of America foreclosure, we can actually give you something called an FHA 203k loan, which means instead of you paying like 9% interest and paying all these fees, you can get a regular 30 year fixed rate loan at a 4.5% interest rate with 3.5% down and we'll even lend you $50,000 to go fix up the place. And if you buy this place, you would actually get priority. You probably have to pay more, they said, but you would get priority over a flipper or investor because the US government wants banks to sell houses to people like me, not to investors. Hmm. The only catch they said was, and this is where the option four comes in. Remember option three was hard money. They're like, the only catch is you got to find somebody that can qualify for the loan because you ain't going to qualify for it. And I'm like, okay, well, how's that going to work? And they're like, well, Kevin, good thing is you don't have any debt. So you're basically worth a big fat zero, which is actually better than a lot of people's situations because a lot of students come in here and they're worth negative $50,000. And on a monthly basis, they're worth like negative 500 to $700. And it's like, yeah, no, you ain't getting the loan. But because I didn't have any debt and I had my credit already established on my 18th birthday, I walked into Wells Fargo and got myself a credit card, put a nice custom picture of Lauren myself on it. Anyway, credit was established and we didn't have any debt. They said, hey, find a family member you could co-sign with and you could go with this option. If you can't find a family member, then you could always go with the hard money loan option and you'll still get priority because you're a home buyer. And again, I still had to pay more than the other people. But I ended up finding a family member and ended up making that work. So I was able to avoid a hard money loan, but I still ended up refinancing the property within about six months. And by then the market had extrapolated in value. And I ended up making around $200,000 in net worth on that property because that property appreciated to $550,000 between the end of when I bought that property and the next year when I refinanced it. Oh, and it's helpful to know by the time that I refinanced property number one, I had one year of tax returns as a real estate agent, which meant Lauren and I could qualify for the loan ourselves. And then we would use a year to date income statement for our second year, which you can do if you're self-employed. And I have to knock on wood, like the timing on that was insane. That was extremely lucky because there was a big bump in the market, but at bare minimum, my net worth would have been up a hundred grand. So soon after that, and soon after the market appreciated, I ended up finding another deal. And the seller was interested in selling the house for the old values. They hadn't realized that values just moved up like 20% in a matter of four months. And so this seller ended up also being Lauren's elementary school guidance counselor. And she remembered Lauren and also hated having open houses. I met her because for weeks upon weeks, I was passing out flyers, knocking on doors and holding open houses, doing whatever I could to find a fixer upper to buy. And it's kind of like the movie, The Secret. The more effort you put in, all of a sudden, the more opportunities you get. So I took $100,000 out of property number one in that refinance, and we bought number two off market as a rental without having to move, putting 25% down. And we paid $384,700 for that property, which was in an about $550,000 neighborhood at the time, which meant I just got another $100,000 golden ticket. And folks, this is when the snowball started. 
I got so excited about picking up these golden tickets that I did three open houses a weekend, that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just to meet clients and tell them about the real estate cycle, the beauty about buying deals below market value, and all of a sudden, people were using me to help them find golden tickets too. I, I really felt like I was Willy Wonka, <laughs> and I'm like, let's go find some more tickets, giving out chocolate bars. And the sellers uh, that were also in the community are like, hey, like if you're helping buyers do those things, can you help us prevent us selling a golden ticket? Because sellers want to keep the value, right? Surprisingly, most agents in my area don't fix up properties before they sell them. It takes special tricks and special formulas to fix up a house affordably, and that gets really complicated, and a lot of people are so worried about liability, and oh my gosh, what if the seller sues me or something goes wrong? Or, eh. Whatever. <laughs> it created all these opportunities for me to fix up properties instead of other agents, and so I got a lot more listings which the more people I sold houses for, the more people I bu helped buy houses with, the more commissions I got, and the more houses I was able to buy. <laughs> which, so it, it kind of always like this big cycle of the more I help people buy, the more I'm able to buy myself. And I used the profits for my business, and my goal was if I could buy one house every single year, it would mean by the time I'm 39 years old, I would have 20 houses. And I mean, it's, you know, it'd be kind of ironic, keep this in mind too, it'd be kind of ironic if I was telling people to buy golden tickets, but I wasn't actually trying to buy golden tickets myself. But let's be real, I don't have an endless amount of money, so I can't buy every deal that comes up. So you give some golden tickets away and you keep one for yourself every year. That was my goal. And by the time I was 39, that'd mean I have 20 houses and hey, that's probably good enough to retire on. Actually, it's very well good enough to retire on. And, you know, this, by the way, just keep this in mind as a side note if you're thinking about being an agent. This is very different from working at some high-end brokerage and partnering with the main broker on a ton of transactions. I had to find my own clients. So it wasn't like all of a sudden it's like, here's a stream of people to work for. And I wasn't partnering with, you know, some heavy hitter agents who were doing five, $10 million deals. Nope. These were three to four to $500,000 houses and I had to find every client myself, almost every client myself. I got some referrals. I'd say 95% of my clients were my own that I found by passing out flyers, doing open houses, distributing pumpkins. I had to replace the soles on my dress shoes every six months from how many doors I knocked on, sometimes even more frequently, but that wears you down after a while. But anyway, I never stopped. And so after my first house between 2011 uh, and 2012, and my second in 2013, I bought my third in 2014 as a short sale that I found on the market for $425,000. It was also in about a $550,000 neighborhood. So you can kind of see inherently a lesson here that if you kind of get used to your market, you can look at a property and start going, hmm, that's cheap, like that should be worth more. And so I stayed in my radius, around 30 minutes of where I live, and I just became an expert at these particular kinds of property. And that made it a lot easier to help my sellers and buyers, and it made it a lot easier for me to identify deals as well. And every house I bought, I always told myself that I would learn one thing. So on that third house I bought, I ended up teaching myself how to become a master electrician through YouTube. Let's just say I failed, <laughs> but I ended up hiring an electrician to show me how badly I sucked so I could learn how to do things correctly, which that was really cool. I feel like now I'm at least decently versed in some electrical aspects. Uh, and then Lauren and I bought our fourth property in 2015, which is actually the house we live in now. We paid $602,000 for that house and the house was probably worth around 650 at the time. This one we got off market and we didn't spend a dime on it when we bought it. We just left it as is. And I found this one off market because I told all the realtors in my community, I want a house in this particular neighborhood. Honestly, I didn't even really want the house. Lauren wanted it. So I told all the neighbor, all the realtors, I'm like, I need this house for Lauren. Help me find one, please. <laughs> and sure enough, somebody called me. They're like, hey, we know you want a house over here. I'm like, I'll buy it. We met the seller face to face, walked through the house. After a five minute walk through the house, Lauren, my father-in-law, and myself, we walked out into the patio. Lauren's like heavily pregnant. <laughs> and we closed the sliding door, we look at each other, and we all looked and said, buy it, buy it, buy it. <laughs> we went back in and said, all right, we'll make you a full price offer. Now, the seller, of course, naturally said, well, you know, I'm thinking about putting the house on the market. Uh, and uh, so I quickly responded and said, well, 
You could do that. But if you do that, my full price non-contingent offer is gone. So you have a bird in hand or you can go for the two in the bush. He took my offer. <laughs> I only moved once, but moving was, uh, you know, moving sucks. So moving only once was cool. Uh, and because I moved into this place, I was able to put less money down, which I generally recommend. And, you know, I could have done 5% down, but in this one, I actually did something known as an 80-10-10 loan. This means I put 10% down, but I don't pay any mortgage insurance because I get a credit line for 10%. And then it's as if I put 20% down on the first loan. So that was really cool. And then I was able to use that credit line to go buy other real estate as I kind of paid that off and drew on it, paid it off, drew on it. It's great. In 2016, I bought a short sale that was on the market for $510,000 that cash buyers kept trying to buy, but they kept canceling. And the seller said, the seller's agent said, there's no way I'm selling it to you, dude. Come on, you got a loan. And I said, don't worry about the loan. I'll put my deposit on the line and I'll remove my loan contingency. <laughs> well, then we get into escrow and uh, let's just say the lender found out uh, there was a water leak and drywall was missing and the furnace was broken. Mm -hmm. It was a problem. And so the lender said, Kevin, this deal's dead. And I'm like, that's not good for my deposit. <laughs> well, I told the lender, give me a week. And within a week, I had the drywall fixed, all the water damage removed, and a new furnace installed in the seller's property. Called up the lender and said, hey, send that appraiser out again. And let's just say the lender's jaw dropped, thinking, dude, I can't believe this guy had the balls to go fix up a seller's house just to be able to buy it. Yeah, I did though. <laughs> In 2017, I bought house number six on the market. And I say on the market as in I bought it from the MLS or Zillow or, or Redfin. If I say off the market, it means it's through a, you know, a real, like a connection or whatever. 2017, I bought a house number six on the market. In this house, I did a massive renovation and I even did an office edition, which that additions are stupid. <laughs> I bought this place for $688,000 and it was worth $900,000 when I was finished with it. In 2018, I bought a house that I ended up flipping, which to this day, just yesterday I drove by this house and I regret having sold that house. That was a great house. Flipping sucks when you're trying to build a portfolio. And it's nice for like, ooh, I just made some quick money on an option. Sure, but all the selling fees in real estate eat away at your growth and your portfolio's value. I hate selling. I hate selling stocks too, quite frankly. I just hate selling. As, uh, as I like to say, I sell real estate. I don't sell real estate. Anyway, I bought the place for around $482,000 and sold it for six twenty. dollars Through 2018, my income was exclusively helping people do real estate. That's it. So from 2010 to 2018, I just help people buy and sell real estate. And I use that income to buy my own golden tickets, which I bought on average one a year. Lauren and I mostly saved all the money we made. So we would do anything we could to save money and sacrifice ourselves to be able to buy more golden tickets. Cause it's like, oh my gosh, do we want to buy a $50,000 fancy car? Or do we want to take that $50,000, buy a golden ticket? That's going to make us another hundred grand on top of that. Mm -hmm. So when people are like, Kevin, Kevin, should I buy a Tesla Model 3? Even though I own a lot of Tesla shares, I'm like, uh, no, that's stupid. That's dumb. Yeah. It's a bad idea. <laughs> Don't waste your money on cars. Uh, and it's true. And then, you know, I get some people that are like, oh, but Kevin, oh, but Kevin, you should buy gold because the dollar might lose value. And that's true. I hate cash and I hate the dollar too. And in fact, that's exactly why I put all my money into stocks and real estate. And at the end of 2018 and throughout 2019, I started sharing my strategies instead of just with people in person, where I used to have like three hour coffee shop meetings to teach people about buying wedge deals and buying golden tickets and people are like, oh my God, this seems genius, but how do we start? And then it'd take me like weeks and months to, to mold people into wedge deal buyers. It's not that easy. It's not something you could pick up in five minutes, but anybody can do it. Anyway, I started sharing my strategies and teaching these tricks and these psychology uh, and the psychology that I use in a real estate investing course that I started selling online. Uh, and later in 2019, my entire formula for my zero eviction record for tenants, never had an eviction, <laughs> never planned to have an eviction, knock on wood, uh, and my rental formula for renovations. Uh, you know, how to do exactly the style, let's do this, don't do this, noob versus pro, things like that. But basically what I started doing is I took my teachings from in person and coffee shops to online. 
And let's just say online pays you more than meeting people at a coffee shop does. But this is where you wanna be careful because it's easy for people to say, oh yeah, I got successful doing this. And then they sell that idea online. But then as soon as they get successful online, they don't do that strategy anymore. It's kind of like, uh, I don't wanna give any particular examples here, but oh, I don't know, drop shipping or Amazon FBA. Oh yeah, look at all this money I made. Look how easy it is. And, and then they don't do that. See, the difference with me, and I'm not trying to cast shade here, it just is what it is, is I still do what I teach every single day. I buy cheap real estate that I know will grow my net worth. And watch the rest of this story, and then let's get into the lessons and the takeaways for you. So in 2019, my income started growing as I took my business online. And all I did was buy more houses. In 2019, I bought three houses. I bought house number seven worth, uh, well, four $650,000 worth, $775,000, the seller ended up flooding out that house the day before the close of escrow, and their insurance company wrote me a big fat check to fix it all up, which that was more free real estate. House number eight, I got for $450,000 in a $630,000 neighborhood, which that house also ended up having a plumbing backup and leak and causing damage, which led an insurance company to write me a $40,000 check to fix that place up. That was convenient. And house number nine, I bought for $465,000 worth $640,000. Oh, and I should say the 650 and the uh, 465 I bought on the market on the MLS, the $450,000 house was an expired listing that was a for sale by owner and I hit the seller up directly. In 2020, things changed a bit and we're gonna go even faster here, but let's just say my income from YouTube and my views and my revenue from my courses went up. And often what would happen is I kind of found that for every one person who buys one of my courses, they tell like two to three other people to buy the course because they love the value that's in it and they wanna share that with other people. So uh, that has really helped the course be extremely successful. Most people start with the zero to millionaire real estate investing course, and then they move into like property management or maybe the money and stock course and things like that. Some people pick up the YouTube course I have now. Uh, but this is also around the time that, uh, that I started talk looking for other ways to find deals. And so recently in 2020, I partnered with this company called Deal Machine, and they make it so that when I'm riding my Segway around with my kids and I see a fixer upper, I could take a picture of that house and automatically put that deal into a 12 month follow-up cycle to send that person a postcard. Uh, you know, I don't, this is not the postcard, but this is just a postcard. Uh, and this shows up in the mail every single month and it's like, oh, Kevin will buy my house as is, oh. I'm just trying to find deals off market. And so I'm partnering with Deal Machine to do that. A link down below, by the way, if you want uh, a discount working with them or some free credits. But anyway, Here's what I did in 2020 as my income went up. I didn't retire and I didn't stop what I was doing. Instead, and we're gonna speed this one up, all right, you ready? I bought house number 10 for $660,000 on the market worth 825. I bought house number 11 for 525 on the market versus worth 700K. I bought house number 12 for $450,000 off market from someone, this was off market from somebody who knew I did renovations. Uh, this was a great one. This was the Hoarder House. You could type into YouTube, meet Kevin Hoarder House and you'll see it. Uh, and that place is now worth $700,000. House number 13 for 559 on the market worth $700,000. House number 14, $580,000 on the market for $725,000. So just FYI, if, if people say, oh, you can't find deals, you ain't looking hard enough because I got a lot of deals this year. Property number 15 is a four unit apartment building. Now in fairness, I got this one off market, but you get your off market connections from actually doing business. But anyway, I bought this four unit apartment building. I bought this property. Now this one, in fairness, I got a little lucky in. This four unit apartment building, I actually bought from Lauren's parents, which what's insane about that is I inherited their tax basis because if an in-law, like if you buy a house from an in-law in California, you keep their tax basis because in California, usually you'd have a new tax basis. So my tax basis is 28% lower than what it should have been. And these are huge units. They're all like three bedroom, four bedroom uh, townhouses. Uh, on this property, I'll be adding two units and I'll be turning this into a six unit apartment building. Property 16 I bought for $750,000 from an agent also who knows that I fixed stuff up. 
$750,000. This house I'm going to turn into a three unit apartment building by converting the detached garage and another part of the house where there was an add-on done, a legal add-on. And so I'm gonna have three units on that property, two guest units in a house. Property 17 is a $722,000 house I bought on the market, probably worth somewhere around 850. Property 18 is a $1.33 million beach home that I bought on the market. It was uh, probably about, well, let's see, they had it listed for 1.5 and I wrote an offer for $170,000 under the listing price. Nobody else wanted to put pen to paper on it. They're just like, well, I'll verbally pay 1.3 for it or whatever. Well, um, I put pen to paper and I got the deal. And the day after I got the deal, somebody offered me $50,000 to walk away from the deal. That'll be a $1.8 million project when it's done. Probably worth around 1.5 right now until I fix it. But anyway, I'm in escrow on three more. Two of them are off-market houses that were agents that helped me buy other deals. And they're like, hey, Kevin, you were fun to work with on those other deals. You want to buy this one too? That's cool. And I'm buying a three-unit apartment building that was built in the early 1900s. It's going to be the earliest, like, well, I should say the oldest property I've ever bought. It's in downtown, and I'll be able to convert this from a three-unit building into the original four-unit building that it was. And I should be able to add two guest units on top of that by turning the garage into a guest unit and then building another guest unit on top of the garage. <laughs> that means we're going to turn a three-unit apartment building I paid a million two sixty-five for it into a six unit building. That's gonna be fun. All that added up to, well, now, today, because some of these values have gone up substantially, like the first ones I bought are not worth 550 anymore, they're worth like 675 now, or seven in some cases. Anyway, all of this adds up to $17 million of real estate. And here is the beauty about real estate. When the market crashed on March 6th because of the pandemic, well, it didn't really crash on March 6th. It hit bottom on March 23rd. But on March 6th, the Federal Reserve, and this is why I always make those Federal Reserve videos, people are like, oh, but Kevin, why are you making all those Federal Reserve videos? I pay attention to the Fed because they make me money, okay? As soon as the Fed came out on a Sunday and said, yo, we are dropping interest rates emergency style, I instantly called my lender and said, um, Hello, I'd like to refinance property one, two, three, and four. And in about three weeks, I'd like to refinance property six, seven, eight, and nine. <laughs> and by early April, I had over $2 million of cash that I was able to invest in the stock market right at the bottom of the market. I guess you could just look back at my whole life and say, I just got really lucky. Or maybe I just put the effort out there. And yeah, sometimes you also get lucky. My stock portfolio today, uh, having invested that $2 million plus other income uh, and growth is now worth over $9 million. Uh, and that's how I did it. That's how I started with nothing, using skills that I learned by buying one stupid fixer upper and then making mistakes on every single stupid property I bought after that to finally be a little bit less stupid today to teach people on YouTube and in my teachable courses how to be a little less stupid when you buy stuff. Now it's helpful that I also got to partner with Lowe's and you know we get you know 10 to 15% off at Lowe's and I could share that discount with my course members and things like that. Like those things are cool, but you know it all came from that one stinking first house. And as my income grew, I just did more of what I was good at. And because I bought assets and didn't blow my money as my income grew, so did my ability to acquire things. Now, I'm gonna give some lessons here, some big secrets, but I do quickly wanna say, uh, yeah, I kind of have stopped helping other people buy real estate or sell real estate. It, it doesn't make sense right now to do that, uh, mostly because I'm trying to buy as many deals as I can myself. But I do want to clarify that. So there was a transition in 2019, and in 2020, I stopped completely. So just to be transparent. And this is why when people leave me comments, they're like, oh, but Kevin, you're just a real estate agent trying to get people to buy houses. That's nah, not really true anymore. <laughs> I'm mostly just doing my own deals. Okay, number one, big secret, start. Buy your first property, don't be a tenant. Being a tenant, based on my story, being a tenant, stupid. You gotta move in two years, I don't care, buy a place, and then you have a reason to buy another place. Number two, get your money in the stock market. While you wait to buy real estate, get invested. And I don't care if your stocks lose money tomorrow or they lose money in a month, I'm worried about what your investments are going to do over the next 10, 20 years. And my belief is we gotta stay in the market. It doesn't matter what happens. When the market crashed in March, all I did was buy more. 
Now, I did make a mistake this year, and that was going a little bit too heavy on margin. Now, fortunately, margin is about one and a half weeks away from being totally paid off, so I will have zero margin debt, uh, which is a day I'm really looking forward to. Probably next week. We'll see. Anyway, uh, when it comes to money, focus on your money mentality. Money mentality means, are you putting money into a stupid savings account and wasting money via the opportunity cost of not investing? Or are you finally realizing that a savings account ain't gonna make you safe. If anything, it's gonna make you less safe. And getting your money in the market is what's most important. Investing, real estate, stocks, real estate, stocks, real estate, stocks, simple. Number three, get educated on what you're buying. If you're clueless about stocks, buy an index fund. Uh, you know, if you, you could go to metkevin.com slash basket, and those are my four favorite index funds separated into the allocations I like. Or honestly, pick your top favorite 30 to 40 companies. You could look at my top favorite by going to metkevin.com slash 1337v11. Those are not my top, those are my top choices broken down. If you're buying real estate, become an expert in your market. And how do you do that? You just go visit a lot of houses. You start realizing if you visit 20 houses in your neighborhood or you know, within 15, 20 minutes of where you live, you start realizing like, oh, that place just hit the market and that looks pretty dang cheap. And then you go over and you say, well, maybe I should write an offer on it. Then you'll also start learning. Is your market an appreciation market or is it a cash flow market or is it a mix of both? And how do you succeed in those markets? How do you succeed in buying single family versus multifamily? For example, most people overpay for multifamily real estate because they watch one YouTube video where somebody, you know, magically draws together numbers and says, oh, look, you can house hack and make it make sense. Yeah, in some places you can do that, but you have to be careful. The majority of multifamily home buyers overpay. The rule of thumb is if you're buying multifamily, buy move-in ready real estate below market value. Uh, rent value. That's the key for multifamily. So if you're thinking multifamily, you got to get low rents, but it should be move and ready. Fixing up multifamily kind of sucks. And there are ways to get really good deals on like duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes when they're vacant and fixer uppers. But everything in multifamily is based on rent values. Rents equal money. That's it. When it comes to single family, you have to use a totally different strategy. You buy fixer uppers for cheaper than what it costs to fix them. You buy a place for $400,000, it better be worth 550 plus fixed up. Rule number five, and then don't spend more than like 50K on it. Rule number five, get insured. People get so freaked out about investing that they panic and they don't get, they don't do anything. Get invested. Get a landlord insurance policy for your rentals. Get an umbrella policy for all your rentals. Worry about an LLC once you get over a million dollars. My opinion, not an attorney, not a CPA. Seek advice from attorney or CPA if you want that kind of advice but that's just my POV. Get insured and build some wealth and then worry about protecting your wealth. Then number six, realize that every single dollar you spend on stupid crap robs you of investing money. Like that car example I gave, when you spend $45,000 on a car, realize that if you divide that by your tax rate, you really have to work at your job to earn about $64,000. That's more than the national median income per year. Uh, and that brings up number seven. If you don't have a great job, get a great job. Learn a skill. Uh, you know, I took tests to become a real estate agent, a real estate broker, a licensed loan officer, a licensed lender, a licensed contractor, a licensed drone pilot. Yeah, there's actually a license for that. It's stupid, but anyway. Uh, all of these things, and I'm still expanding, but all of these things individually are things that you can use to make money. Maybe not the drone one, but anyway. The point is, you can make money out there. There are many ways to make money out there. Get a skill, do Matterport 3D scanning, learn to code, get a six figure job in NorCal after you do a coding bootcamp, figure out something you like doing and then milk your job. I think there's such this passion of, oh, let me just, you know, make a bunch of money real quick and then I could quit my job. When on the flip side, if you manipulate your job into being something that you could use to help you buy real estate, you start loving your job because all of a sudden it's like, hmm, this job that pays me a salary lets me buy real estate. Do that for the next 10 to 15 years, try to buy a place every year or two, and you should be able to retire. Or you'll end up like me, who still works because now it's fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Check out all the links to Weeble, two free stocks with them, life insurance, and of course, the amazing courses all linked down below. Thanks for watching and until next time.